All right, welcome. Thank you all for fighting your way through uh, another we weather bout. You all know that we, uh, we had to cancel the first round of uh, this event a couple of weeks ago when we all got dumped with a lot of snow, and we appreciate you coming out um, for this event. It is winter. We live in Minnesota, so what are we going to do? Uh, uh, Downtown Live is a series of civic engagement events that were sort of created by a group of volunteers who basically are among the downtown residents who now call downtown home. I've worked in downtown for, I worked at TPT for 37 years, so I worked in Lower Town for 30 of those years or something like that. Um, but my wife and I have lived here only for four years and are really delighted to call downtown our home. And increasingly, as we've seen many of you at events around downtown, it just hit us that there ought to be a time when four or five times a year we get together and talk about things that we're all talking about anyway. But to hear from people who have uh, uh, strong opinions and, and intelligent and informed opinions. So that's what Downtown Live is, is supposed to be and has been so far successful at. Uh, tonight, obviously, we're talking about the parks. Uh, there is a high level of passion about uh, well, okay, my name is Bill Hanley, and thank you very much, though. For, so yeah, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I know. Everybody wanted to know what my name was, but in any event, um, the parks have a great and high degree of passion uh, from all of us, uh, especially when you live in a downtown. There are many wonderful things about living in a downtown, but you want to have a park somewhere near you, especially if you have children and we've been talking to people who are trying to raise kids in downtown and it's really an important thing. So we thought, let's take an entire 90 minutes and devote it to the parks. And so that's what we're doing tonight. We'll start with specific focus on Pedro Park. And at the end of that 40 minute time frame, there will be a time, 10 minutes or so, where I will be standing down here and you can come forward and ask questions. So when you see me standing down there with a microphone, this would be the time to line up if you've got questions about Pedro Park. And then we will launch into the second half of the evening, which will be a discussion of the other parks. Uh, what are the developments? What are some of the th questions that people have about what's going on in Rice and Mears and uh, Lower Landing, which is a sort of a new park, and uh, Wakuda Commons. So we're excited about that. Um, should mention that we have uh, event like this, you know, as informal as it is, and you will discover tonight will be very informal. We'll be talking to Eric, and there'll be sort of back chatter, and it, it should be it should be a conversation. Uh, but there are sponsors involved in this, as informal a, a thing as it is, and so we want to thank those folks. The History Theater, of course, what a spectacular space. We. we <laughs> We certainly want to make sure nothing bad happens to this space with all of the other questions about um, the rest of the building. Mayor, we want to make sure nothing bad happens to this space. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, um, Capital River Council, which is, of course, extremely valuable to all of us as a place where we all get together and we can, and we can actually have some of our um, big issues uh, aired. Um, street teams, which is generally associated with Capital River Council, a group of citizens or residents who are helping people to get together and find their way around town when there's a special event, and that's a good thing. Huga Cafe uh, on 4th Street, right across from the Union Depot. If you've been in there, it's a wonderful space. You should go, and they've been, <laughs> yay. And then our friends at SPNN, and SPNN will of course be covering this. They'll also make a YouTube video available in a few days, and we will send out to all the social media and email stuff where that can be uh, uh, found. Um, and then there's organizers. Uh, John Manillo, who's well known as a developer uh, here in town, he's been extraordinarily helpful. Peg Gilfoyle, who you'll see uh, also tonight, She's been just absolutely essential. Uh, Stephen Ussery, an old friend of mine from TPT, has been in charge of sort of helping us pull things together, and especially the PowerPoint. Um, and then my old friend from my many, many, many years associated with TPT and Almanac, uh, Eric Escala. Uh, <laughs> yay! Uh, <laughs> Every community needs somebody like Eric, who can ask the tough questions, who's not really embarrassed by anything, and so we really, 
<laughs> Not embarrassed. You can't, you can't embarrass Eric, I think is the key. Thing. I got plenty to be embarrassed about. <laughs> and so with that, Eric, it's yours. Pedro Park has been uh, quite controversial. I'm Switzerland. I live in Loring Park in downtown Minneapolis. Um, you folks, though, I just quickly want to say, you fo it's President's Day. You folks could have been out getting red, white, and blue savings at a mattress store or a used car lot. <laughs> And you came here tonight, so it speaks well for St. Paul and our democracy. I think you all know the issues about Pedro Park, but uh, we have Katie Berg in the middle, who's an activist in support of the park. Your council member, Rebecca Naker. Thrilled to have those two here, and of course, Mayor Carter is here. Give him a nice round of applause. Let's keep our opening remarks brief, and Mayor, and this is what I've got uh, in mind here. Katie, I want you to give a couple minutes on kind of the background and how we got here, but just the, the elevator version, maybe. Uh, Councilmember Naker, maybe your view of the situation. And then, Mayor, I'd like to, after you hear from a constituent and uh, the representative of the folks here, maybe you can react and give your view on Does that sound okay? Sure. Katie, go ahead. Well, it's interesting that I get to give the elevator speech because I'm the new kid on the block. I'm actually... Put your mic down well, so people I could be one of the newest people to this issue. I moved to St. Paul just four years ago, and I decided to purchase with my two children downtown St. Paul after the headline showed up that the police training facility had been granted $18 million, the police annex building was going to be torn down, and the park was going to get larger. That was the headline. And I thought my luck was perfect, my timing. I bought a condo. We invested into remodeling it to fit our family. And about six months after we moved in, the uh, former Mayor Coleman announced a uh, change in direction and that he wanted office space instead of a park at the location of the annex. And I, um, for my children and for the thousands of other people that moved to our neighborhood, we did double in size since the park was being planned. Uh, we were expecting that park, counting on that park, buying into the idea of that park, and I'm very committed to seeing that happen. Council member? How do, you, how do you see the situation, and, and uh, just where, where are we here this evening? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, it's, it's great to see so many constituents. I think, I think I see constituents. I can't quite see from the stage, but I do. <laughs> I think I recognize some people, and I really appreciate um, you all being here tonight. And I also just wanted to really thank Bill Hanley. Um, this, this shows what vision can do. He had a vision for what Downtown Live could be, and it's happening right now. So I just, I just wanted to say that. Um, I think we need expanded an expanded Pedro Park. I think we need to realize the vision of Pedro Park. We need more green space downtown. One of the things I talk about a lot, talked about a lot when I was running for office the first time, was that we need to see downtown as a neighborhood. We have 8,000 people living downtown now. This is no longer a commercial business district where we roll up the sidewalks at 5 p.m. and people have moved downtown expecting that they will have the same amenities that you would have in any neighborhood of our city. And I think what's been really poignant for me about talking to Katie and talking to others on this issue is that what, what hasn't changed is the vision for an expanded Pedro Park. What may have changed is what exactly that park looks like. I think when we first started envisioning this park, people assumed this had to be a really highly manicured, landscaped, you know, downtown park. But what I keep hearing when I talk to people is we don't necessarily need another rice, another mirrors, we don't need boulders <laughs> and streams, right? We need a place where our kids, I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old, right? I understand this, can run around, can just throw a ball around, can be kids, can be outside, can have a lawn, right, a great lawn. And that is something that we're lacking downtown. And I also just point out that downtown is the only part of our city, if you look at the map, that is outside the half mile radius of a rec center. So we actually have a huge gap downtown, ap apart from green space, in just places for kids to run around even inside. So I, I think we need expanded green space downtown and on the Pedro Park side. Mayor, react to this if you would, and, and this has been dumped on your desk as the new mayor. And uh, wh where do we, where are we, and where do we go from here? Well, I, I put, the, put the mic up so sure. we can. I definitely appreciate the points that, uh, both of you are making. I certainly appreciate uh, uh, Councilmember Naker's uh, leadership on this issue. We've gotten a chance to uh, sit right across the street and just chat about this and many other issues as well. Um, I, I would agree. You know, I think what I think um, I lament some about just this conversation is the notion that we're pitting green space against tax base. Uh, and in a lot of ways, you know, we, we have to look at, I think, downtown as we look at every other neighborhood. 
it's a neighborhood that requires kind of a full kind of 360 degrees of neighborhood amenities, which includes tax base, which includes park space, which includes kind of a, a number of things. Now, our re kind of renaissance that we've experienced downtown, where we've got some wind in our sails, and downtown is, is happening in a way that it hasn't always been. Uh, and that's been really um, generated and I think fueled uh, by seeing downtown, as you just said, Councilman Manaker, uh, as a neighborhood and not just a business district. And that requires investment in neighborhood amenities uh, that I think we, you know, to the point that you just made, uh, have some work to do to build the type of amenities that downtown really needs. You know, I, again, as I said, I, I don't think that this is a uh, tax base versus, you know, green space type of situation because obviously expanding our tax base is how we afford, uh, especially in the context of a, a city that has millions of dollars of investment that we need to do in our existing parks and recreation centers, that expanding our tax base is how we afford to be able to build and kind of renovate uh, new parks. Uh, and so I'm, con I'm, I'm absolutely committed to continuing the conversation with all of you guys uh, to figure out how we make that space the best space, not just imagine the best space that we could see, uh, but really build it out to be uh, a useful space in our community that obviously has some challenges uh, as somebody who was on the council and the HRA uh, when we uh, established the original plan and as we um, um, reaffirmed that original plan a couple of times uh, I'm very aware of the challenges that we've had in just funding a new park space so uh, navigating all of those balances I think to find the best uh, actionable plan that we can for the area uh, is something that is important to me the last thing I'll say and I see you starting to cut off cut me off here I'm good at uh, that. is that uh, I appreciate all of you guys being here. To your point, people, there's a lot of other places that people could be, not just because it's President's Day, but there's always uh, other places that you could be. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I've learned is critical towards having a vibrant, strong neighborhood uh, is strong, uh, engaged neighbors. Uh, and that's something that I see downtown having. Uh, and that, I think, bodes very well for our whole city and for downtown. I think if you're, go ahead. I, th I think if you're steeped in how government works, you would know that maybe a comprehensive plan is a, a goal or a wish, but it's not a fait accompli. Uh, and I, I wonder, Council Member Naylor, and I wouldn't put this at your feet, uh, but I wonder if the city oversold this or, or sent mixed signals that this somehow was going to happen once the land was, was donated and maybe folks in the neighborhood got the wrong signal that, um, uh, once they had the news conference and unveiled the say, the donation of the land that this was going to happen. I do think plans are aspirational. I mean, I think we, we put things in plans. I was part of the Westside Flats planning task force for two years that laid out a vision for what that area would be in the future. And it's, you know, it's sort of when and as redevelopment occurs, this is what we hope will happen here. Um, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that plans are written in stone, but I do think the comprehensive plan is, is an important document that lays out our vision for the city. Mm -hmm. um, and to veer off from that, I think, requires really compelling circumstances. One of the reasons why I voted against um, granting tentative developer status to the developer who's proposed to redevelop the public safety annex on the site is because I really didn't think that there was any compelling reason for why we would go off of that plan. I didn't think enough had changed from when we, when, when we created the original plan to now. As, as the mayor points out, we always have funding challenges. It's something that I'm very aware of as, as one of my primary responsibilities is to pass our budget every year and to figure out where the money's gonna come from for all the different competing needs that we have. But, but that's exactly the point. It's always a problem that we have. So saying that funds don't exist right now for this project is sort of the status quo. Funds never exist until we say this is a priority this is where we're going in for CIB funding. This is where we're doing some grant writing. This is where we're putting together a community advisory committee to help us, right? Just like Downtown Live, it takes a vision, it takes a group of committed people on the council, in the community, in the mayor's office. But, you know, the, the fact that you're starting from zero isn't abnormal. That's how everything starts. Katie, I uh, talked to somebody at City Hall today, and, and they said that the million dollars for uh, that the Ackerberg would pay for the, the building would go to fund the smaller park. And I even wrote down the, the thought that this person said. He said, without that money, uh, we'll, we'll, it, it'll either be a nice half block park or not much of anything full block park. You wanna re react to that and whatever else you've heard here? And pull the mic up so they can hear. My priority and my uh, goal is to have 
Put the mic up. Is to first and foremost have a bigger park, okay. and then worry about making it better. Because if we have a smaller park, we can't go. We're stuck. And I think the fifth part of why I wanted to be up here was to counter some of the political speak that's happening. Because as I've been part of this process for the last five months, there is the, the words that say, of course we want an expanded park. Of course we want um, these things. But the actions that are being taken in the background without community input go counter. And I'd like to say, too, that it isn't a controversial issue. As I understand it, as I've been learning and putting the pieces together, there were five people who supported this, the mayor and four council uh, persons. And, and now we have a new mayor. So <laughs> hopefully we're down to four. <laughs> and Russ Stark has. <laughs> um, you're right, resigned, and so, so there's a new person that we can lobby. Now, the special election is in <laughs> mid-August, I'm told, and mm -hmm. I think the council's going to vote in June. Mayor, is that correct? The council has established, the council has uh, provided ten tentative developer status uh, to the developer, um, and I think, Rebecca, I think Councilmember Naker would be better than me to say what the next council vote would be. They have 180 days from when the tentative developer status is granted, which I think we said began in January when they could get access to the building. So yeah, it'll be before the new election. Katie, go ahead. Uh, which, the, the physical realities of what is being said, I mean, need, like you need to look at a map, and when we say we're going to expand a park, where do we expand it to? There's an alley there. There's the donation agreement that we have um, with the Pinto family that says it's going to be expanded. And so there's... there's um, there's a problem there. But I do, I really want to introduce somebody that's here. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, who can, uh, we have a superhero, a neighborhood superhero in the audience today. Marilyn Patera, uh, born Miss Pedro, or Pedro, of the Pedro family, is here. And it is her generosity, uh, her and her brothers, her brothers who are no longer with us, but Marilyn is here to speak for her family and her position. Um, and I just, I, I just She's here, and if we could give her a round of applause, because no matter what happens, she's a hero for our neighborhood. I want to turn around. I want to turn around and face the audience. Okay. Um, these are my people now. Excellent. <laughs> and uh, this is very emotional for me. Um, I've uh, been through a lot. It started when I donated the piece with my brothers. As uh, Katie said, they're gone now. But um, their uh, legacy remains. We were told things verbally. We were told things in writing. There is an agreement. You can call it a contract. I guess an attorney, if we had one here tonight, would call it a legal binding agreement. Promises were made and expectations were put into place. We expected something back for what we gave. It has been nothing but a nightmare and a struggle ever since I gave up my, um, ever since I made my part of the gift uh, donation. I won't go into any more detail, but it's been a real problem for me personally. I'm the only one left. There's nobody for me to lean on or f help me fight through this. This is a pitiful, shameful episode in my life. I want to see the contract and the park come to life the way it was supposed to be, the way it was promised, the way my brothers and I expected it to be. The decision to sell the annex was made without anybody's knowledge or approval. Nobody knew about it. It was done behind closed doors. Why weren't you all invited to be there? How could that happen? How could this happen? This is just more government tragedy happening right before our face. Well, let's get some reaction to what you said, ma'am, and maybe they can respond to some of your concerns. <laughs> Mayor? Um, not to get too deep in the weeds, but uh, I guess a process question here. What, uh, was, it, was, it, was there non-transparency? 
which is well. Okay, ma'am, you can have as much time as you want. We're we're here for ninety minutes and go crazy. I I was not done. I was just getting warmed up. <laughs> I haven't even got it in gear yet. <laughs> I've spent two days doing my research, uh, doing my homework, so I could be here tonight to meet you. I wouldn't come ill-prepared. I spent two days, and about an hour ago, I was told that I had one minute to speak. I wrote back to Katie and said, I don't know, I hope I don't blink or sneeze because I will be over my time limit. <laughs> now, I wrote down some stuff, too many pages to go into, but I'll just circle the, uh, tell you the ones I circle that just really jump out at me. I don't know if they'll jump out at you. I hope they do. The first circle says that this, contra this, this episode is done in bad faith. Bad faith. With, here it is, this is not personal, this is business. I'm a businesswoman. This was done with the intention to deceive. I'll repeat that, intention to deceive. I don't think anybody ever intended to fulfill this contract when they made the agreement. That's my opinion. Uh, I think what we've got going here is what they call partial performance. They're doing just enough to give us a little nibble to keep us quiet. That's all we're getting out of this. A little bit of a park, a little bit of a space. And now they're saying they don't have the money. Well, what the hell did you take the gift for? Why did you take the gift? You knew that this would have to be paid. There would be a day that this would have to be paid. Why did you take the gift then? Now, I'm not gonna use the word sue for breach of contract. I would never say that. <laughs> but I know that some people have thought about it. We expect a full city block park. Doesn't have to be tomorrow, next week, next year. Maybe I won't see it. I'm 81 today, and I'll be 81 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> God willing. <laughs> but I uh, am not a quitter. I told Katie I'm not a quitter, and I'm finally going to take the gloves off, stop thinking about myself, and start thinking about you guys. Let's get that park planned. Let's get it in. Let us get it going. All right. To those comments, Mayor. Well, again, I definitely appreciate the gift. I think we all appreciate the gift of the Pedro family. Um, I heard what Council Member Naker said, which was that you know th those those comprehensive plans I think should be our aspirational documents that say like this is what we believe. Um, and I don't know anybody who wouldn't love to see that full block park there. Uh, and I also know, like I said, you know, and we've all kind of acknowledged. Uh, the, 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 the resource challenges that the city exists. I won't attempt to speak for the previous administration uh, and you know, some of the comments that were made, uh, but I do know that you know, making, turning those kind of concepts into concrete uh, always has uh, translation challenges to do. Um, I think it's up to us to work together to find uh, the best kind of, uh, uh, the, the, the build the best vision that we can practically build out uh, for Pedro Park and for all of our downtown. Uh, and I think we all have to work together to do that. Frankly, you know, right now we have in front of us, and one of the reasons I think it's important to hear this conversation out is because we have in front of us the first viable plan to kind of build out this block uh, in over a decade uh, that includes uh, uh, a, a million dollars over the course of the next 20 years for um, not just for the build out, uh, but uh, on top of the build out work, a million dollars for maintenance of a park there, uh, which, you know, I think 
I, I would assume we can all agree uh, that a vacant building and a temporary park uh, is not what we want to see on this block. And so, you know, figuring out not just what we would love to see, uh, but what we can build, I think is something that's important for us. Uh, and, you know, I, I actually think we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our children, uh, and I think we owe it to all of our neighbors uh, to, you know, at the point where we have something kind of concrete in hand, some, an opportunity before us uh, to have the conversation out. Katie and then the, the council member. Oh, this Put the mic up so we can. This is being sold as the first actionable plan uh, in 20 years towards this. And that is not how I see it, and it is not how I would say 99% of my neighbors see it. This is the, the first opportunity for an actionable plan is in fact the sabotage of the plan. Uh, for this is our <laughs> this is the first opportunity we have. We have a vacant building. That's what the CIB, the budget committee, has been waiting for. That's why they gave the police eighteen million dollars to move out. They were expecting to fund this park, and how the city has been selling it is misleading, saying that it's the first time we have an actionable plan when it actually it's the our first opportunity to sabotage the plan, and, um, oh, I could, there's, there's so many um, directions I can go with this, but it's, it's being sold as following the comprehensive plan. That's something that we need to talk about with the language, is because we need to follow the comprehensive plan, and how the majority of us hear that is following the comprehensive plan is the full block park. It clearly says that, but yet in the staff report to the city council members who voted in November, it says, Selling the annex building follows the comprehensive plan because it's a horse historic building, even though there's an exception that says block 10, there's no historic buildings. Block 10, everything gets demolished for the park. And it's being pushed that, uh, that the language that was supposed to protect block 10 to be a park, it's being twisted and misrepresented to say that, oh, well, we can do whatever we want. Um, because we're, this action is disassembling parkland, and it says once the land is assembled, it needs to be a park. All right, council member. Yeah, I just um, I want to call out something that that Marilyn said and that Katie also said earlier, and and. Marilyn, I also really appreciate how you've been willing to sit down with me a number of times now and have coffee and talk about this, um, and I appreciate you being here tonight. And one of the things that you said and that um, Katie has also said is that nobody's expecting this to happen tomorrow. And I think that that's a really important point. Um, I, I agree that this is the first time that we've actually had the opportunity to start realizing the plan because this December, last December, was the first time that the police were actually out of the public safety annex. Um, and, and I think knowing that it's not gonna happen tomorrow, knowing that all of us here are realistic about this, but also knowing that the first step starts now. And if we, if we don't take it now, then we're putting it off um, for future generations to figure out. And not only that, but if we, if we abdicate our responsibility here and lose some of the property that we have, um, I think what, what really resonates with me is we better have a really good backup plan. Because if we're losing property that we have in hand, then the question I have is where does that additional parkland go? And, and how do we acquire that? And, and what, are the, what are the economics behind that assumption? And that's what I've been asking my colleagues for, that's what I've been asking our Parks Department and our Planning and Economic Development Department because before we make a decision about giving up land that we actually have in hand, which could be the first and most obvious place for the park expansion to go, I wanna make sure that we actually understand what the alternative is and how much that's gonna cost. Mayor, this is on the one hand and on the other hand question. We hear that there's a 15, 16% vacancy, office space vacancy rate in St. Paul, but then, how, is it up to 20? Okay, well, let's say 20. Um, but there's also the, on the other side, on the other hand, people say, but we need more creative office, modern office space to make sure that uh, St. Paul doesn't just become a bedroom community to, to Minneapolis. What, what is the real story on the office space situation in, in downtown? Well, it's on one hand and on the other hand. Okay. <laughs> I think uh, bo both are actually true. We do have a uh, vacancy in office space, uh, and one of the things that we've seen businesses tell us, uh, kind of 
over and over and over again uh, is that one of the reasons we have the vacancy that we have is because we don't have uh, an abundance of the types of spaces that today's businesses are really looking for to meet their needs. Uh, and so we've seen businesses move out of downtown because as they're looking for a specific type of space that they're saying that they aren't able to find downtown. So absolutely retro, retrofitting some of that space to make sure that it's the type of space that businesses are looking for uh, is a challenge that we have to uh, see meet in St. Paul. Katie, would, uh, what if they, uh, I, I, the council member said that there's a, this is one area where there isn't a recreation center. What if you had the park on the existing land and then turned the building into a rec center? Would that be something that you could, would that be something? That is a compromise we would be willing to discuss. It is, commu it is dedicated community space. As that's, as for 10 years, this land, the city-owned land, has been said this is going to be for the community. And it's been envisioned as a park. As long as it remains for the community, we can discuss. Or the but building could be used for wintertime activities. When it could be an indoor park. It could be a park pavilion. It could have sport courts. There are possibilities. But the proposal that's on right now is a 100% sell to a private entity, every single square footage. And not only that, they're proposing facing the building to the park with all these glass doors, and it'll become a corporate front entrance instead of a family uh, neighborhood park. And I'm very concerned about that. Bill, do you want to go to questions from the audience, or you want another round of from me? Okay, what I have to say concerns Ackerberg. Now, I did a lot of work looking at Ackerberg. That's okay. the developer, so people The know. developer, okay. the biggest in Minneapolis. Okay. Millions, millions, maybe billions, seven million square feet of office space they, have, they own. 4,000 apartments they have renovated. I can go through a list here from everything from Calhoun Square to townhouses in Minneapolis. They are monsters. They are a behemoth. They do not need that annex building. We need the park. They don't need the annex. Tear down that damn building, that damn 92-year-old behemoth, tear it down, demolish it like they said they would, and what you do after that, there'll be a park and maybe a building. But Ackerberg does not need the annex. These people need the park. And you want to get other questions, Bill? Sure, Jean, do you have or comments? I or? did have a question, and it was listening to Councilman Naker is something that I've been talking about also. Is Parkland downtown is hard to come by. And where else are you going to find a square block as cheap as this opportunity presents itself? We have a gracious donation for a chunk, big chunk of the park. We have a condemned building, which, or a building that we can knock down that we don't have to purchase. We have empty land, and then we have a building housing the chow care, I think it is, that probably is going to be sold or moved in the near future. So think about, you find me another block downtown. So when you talk about the economics of this, this is the cheapest block downtown St. Paul where you're gonna ever find the chance to build a park. So it's very short-sighted. And I'm in favor of the long-sighted people who built Mears Park. Could have put a tower on that for the people who built Wakuta Park. Could have put some more apartment buildings on that. Rice Park. Heck, a parking garage would have been beautiful. But this makes no sense to me. Okay. And the plan really is if once you build this office building out, the other land around there becomes more valuable. It will cost more to buy. Um, it will drive up the value of all that property. There'll be one little entryway for um, the, the commercial building that's there. You're mi we're missing a golden opportunity that started out in generosity and now is being short-sighted. All right. Anybody else, Bill? Um, I, I do have a question, but I want to say happy birthday to Marilyn Patera. <laughs> <laughs> it's your birthday today? You said it was your birthday? 
Oh, I'm Patty Flaherty. I live just on the block at the point. And I want to suggest that there is no way that we could have an adequate park, even if it was a half a block park, um, with that building in place, unless it were part of a community effort if we had it be a rec center or something. Uh, I just don't think it's possible. And with that being said, there's just not enough space um, that's affordable. Otherwise, we're buying the Union Gospel Mission nursery, uh, daycare, and the parking lot. Like um, Jean said, it's economical to use that building. I also want to suggest that from a taxpayer's point of view, that $1 million is a pittance. I mean, really, <laughs> that's just not, I mean, we're talking about like build is, I can't remember how much the upper landing park or lower landing park is going to be, but it's a million dollars is just nothing. I think it was not much more than giving the building away for a dime. Um, and then my third thing is, is that um, I, my understanding of the process is that when um, Ackerberg puts forth their proposal, which is within the 180 days, but it could be tomorrow, we don't know. Um, it could be sooner than that. Then the council, is it the city council or the council acting as the HRA? Both, I think, right? Do both have to vote? I think it's I think it's the HRA. Okay, so there's going to be a vote by the same people that voted um, uh, in November to promote, you know, to sell the building, um, with the exception of Russ Stark, who's replaced by I think um, someone who's probably got similar views. I'm not sure, um, but so how do we, as a community, other than trying to persuade those members to vote against Ackerberg's proposal, how do we? What, what recourse do we have for, um, for stopping this project? Council member. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think what you're doing tonight is, is a huge part of it. I mean, and I, and I would just say, not regardless of the outcome, because I think we all have an outcome that we want in mind, but the, the mobilization that's happened around this issue, and I want to give Katie a lot of credit for that, um, this is what we need in every single neighborhood for every single one of our parks, right? Like Pedro Park in the future is going to be so much stronger because of the people in this room who are so invested in it. So being here to, yeah, I mean, for you, <laughs> for being here. So that's a huge step. I would say when I was talking to my colleagues about the vote back in November, um, one of the sort of mental models, and I don't agree with this model, but it's just, just so you know that it's out there, is that tentative developer status is just, it's kind of like, dating, right? You're not engaged, you're not married, we're just, we're just allowing them six months to see if they really want to make a proposal to us, right? And at that point when they propose is when we really have to think this through. Now, when I was dating, that's not exactly how I thought about it because I didn't want to start down that road and get to the proposal and have to make up my mind, but um, that, that is kind of the way sometimes it is thought of. And so I do think that many of my colleagues will be looking at this much more critically when it comes to signing a development agreement because that's really the moment when we are selling the land um, turning it over for good. So I would say the, the advocacy that you've been doing to date, again, I'm asking for much more concrete figures as to what that plan B looks like, and I think we'll all be able to evaluate what's, what's the realistic alternative if this building stays. Bill, another question? Hello, my name is Dana Conroy, and I live at The Point. Speak I'm up. A, my name's Dana, and I live at The Point, and uh, I'm a brand new grandma, and um, I have a vision. I think that a lot of us who came to live in downtown St. Paul, um, one of the things that we appreciate about it is the diversity here. Um, the cultural and in many ways we are diverse people here. Um, I went to the homeless um, talk that uh, I saw you at, um, Rebecca, um, and heard from lots of people about how we're so segregated, you know, even though we want to be more integrated and we want to appreciate different people of different backgrounds and cultures. What better way than to have a playground in a rec center where our kids are playing with the Union Gospel Mission kids or whoever is around, you know, a family-oriented park that we can all bring our grandchildren and our children to that can be safe because we're all right there, you know, watching out for it. It's not another park that maybe is going to be neglected or something. It's going to be cherished by the people who are living in this community and really want it. So what, what else, wh how else could we create this better than in Pedro Park? Mayor, do you want to react to that? Yeah. Congratulations on being a grandmother, first off. 
that's exciting. Um, and you know, it, it, with that comment and the last comment, I think that, 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 that what you're doing is important. I think engaging in this process is very important. Um, I actually am a firm believer in public engagement and in you know, people engaging in the process of determining and, and having an impact on the processes that, that have an impact on our lives. Uh, and so you know, in, in the context of the, the previous question as well, I think getting engaged, there will certainly continue to be public hearings in front of the HRA. Uh, all of those members are, of course, public and are actually very interested, I think, in, ha in having this conversation in a very robust manner. So I think there's plenty of opportunity to continue a constructive dialogue about you know, the, the, the type of downtown we're building, the type of block we're building near right at Pedro Park, uh, and just the type of city that we're building together. So I would encourage you to continue to doing to to continue doing what you're doing, certainly starting with your own council member, Naker, who's here today, uh, and continuing to engaging our entire HRA, and, and me as well. Katie's fired up again, go ahead. Oh, yes. get, get the mic up though, so we- Public hearings and continued engagement really, really caught my ear, because this is actually the very first time that we uh, have a, a discussion about this. In February 2017, when the city did their 180 degree on the plan for the annex, the, um, we were told, let's see if there's interest in this building. And if there is, we'll have the debate then, whether it's a good idea to have office space or park. That debate has never happened, and I do not count this as part of that debate. The city needs to sponsor something that will, um, that will really put the two sides together, our comprehensive plan or this alternative. Uh, and and the, from the what we are throwing away by the alternative needs to be out there. It's this when it's sold and you don't know the context. It sounds like a great idea. You know, we're saving a building. We're going to get some investment into a park. But in the context, it's it's throwing our neighborhood under the bus. It is. Uh, throwing away 20 years of investment in community planning and engagement, and uh, and it's throwing away faith in the comprehensive plan right. process. Bill, one more question. Yeah, Tom Dunn from City Walk. Uh, I, uh, not unlike most of the people in the building, like the idea of a park, but it's no good if you can't use it. Now we have a love, lot of lovely parks downtown, but you cannot. Uh, you cannot freely and safely move through Rice Park. You've got Cleveland Circle over there in front of Dorothy Day, which is an embarrassment to the city. That just needs to have that flower bed leveled and make it into a parking spot. And uh, you've got one of the best and most beautiful parks ever right over there at Bruce Vento that no woman on her own would feel safe in. And so another park is nice, but if it just becomes another place for people to collect and you end up with another one of those uh, ad hoc villages like the independent people had to go and take down because the city couldn't get at it, then it's, it's a waste of time. You know, I, I love the idea of a park, but if, if, it, if the city's not prepared to make it viable, then there's not worth doing it. If it just attracts more trouble, it just hurts all of us taxpayers. Thank you. Eric, let me just suggest we go through a couple of these. These are more comments and they're valuable. That's great. Let's yeah. go through these two and then we'll get a chance to wrap this part. More, more, more. Let's go. It's great. I actually have a question. Uh, my name is Rod Halverson and I'm the pre uh, president of CityWalk. And I was also on the very first uh, precinct park plan, the Fitzgerald per precinct park plan process. And my question basically is, the city asked us all in the neighborhood, all the stakeholders to get together. They wanted our neighborhood, the 18 block neighbor called Fitzgerald Park area, they wanted us to f tell the city what should be done with block 10, which was on the screen before. And we went through hours and hours, hundreds of hours of staff time from PED, and I see the directors here, and, uh, and, and uh, also the uh, Riverfront Corporation, and hundreds of hours of volunteer time, and we took two years through that process, and we came up with a plan in 2006. And so the city asked us for that, and then the part of the city is a district council. They w supported it. The uh, planning commission supported it. The city council supported it. The mayor supported it at the time. So my question is in regard to trust. I was a public official for 20 years, and one of the things that I thought was most important was people could trust 
my word. And so I want to know how we could ever trust the city again in this neighborhood after all that planning. Why would we ever trust the word of the city again if you turn your back on our plan? Mayor, a brief response? I, I think it's an important question. I, obviously, I wasn't the mayor in 2006 or seven or eight or nine. Uh, and uh, we've got a lot of kind of new folks, right, involved in the process, and that's because the community process just con constantly reinvents itself. You know, to your point, you know, the only community process isn't just the process that happens within City Hall. I count this as community process. I count all of you as people who have contributed to making sure that there is public conversation about this, and that's what I mean when I say this should continue, so I'm glad that it's there. Um, I can't speak, of course, for previous administrations, uh, but I can say that our city is changing. Our city is just changing, and our city is transforming uh, constantly, and our city has changed a whole lot since 2006, uh, and I think it's important for us, and I think that's what I hear you saying here today, is not to just take one, mo mo one moment in time and close the conversation, but we ought, to con we ought to always continue in a continuous conversation and building upon the vision that we've built together for our city, and I think that's important. I think as we do that public conversation, as I engage with the city council and with their the HRA, um, I do so knowing that I'm not necessarily always going to get everything that I say that I'd like for us to kind of put in there, but we as a community have to figure out what both kind of works best for our neighborhood, you know, um, uh, locally, but also in the context of the, the, the city that we're working to build together. Uh, and so that's the conversation that we've been having. That's the conversation we've led through my uh, campaign and through my administration, and that's the conversation that we're going to have to keep on doing. We have a moment in time right now where we get to pick up from right here. We get to engage with all of you who are very passionately engage in the future of our community and we get to look from right here and say how do we build forth the highest and best use not just of this parcel but of all the kind of stuff the decisions that we have to make citywide uh, and I think that's something we have to do together uh, more reaction council member yeah <laughs> didn't want to cut out the applause <laughs> thank both of you I appreciate both of you. <laughs> three three um I, I just uh I wanted to say I think that that is a really important question because the the planning that we do today i mean the city the city's life is is much longer than any of our lifespans certainly longer than any of our time in elected office and if the planning that we do today for for decades from now for generations from now is not seen as having any weight then what is it all for and and i and i will i want to be totally transparent here in case anybody wasn't already aware of this tonight i was in favor of going out and finding out what interest there was in the public safety annex. I was at that meeting in February, and I, I'd asked to have that meeting because I wanted to make sure that we were being open with people about what we were looking at, but I thought we do need more creative class office space downtown, and it would be interesting to see now that we're at this moment, we're several years after the plan, what, what kind of interest is there? And as a result of that conversation, as, and as a result of the conversations that I've had with people in the community since then, I've realized that not only is the compelling reason not there to switch course, but also that trust has really, really nagged at me. And I think that the way that you build trust is when you are changing course, because sometimes we do have to do that. But you have to have really honest conversations with people about what those circumstances are. Why, why is it? And I think that's our job as public officials to come to people honestly and say, look, we have to change course because of X, Y, and Z. I know this is hard, but this is why we have to do it. This is why it matters. If I felt like I had those reasons and I could come to you and say, here's why we have to change course, X, Y, and Z, it would be a hard conversation. I wouldn't want to really be sitting in this seat having that conversation with you, but I would do it because that's my responsibility on behalf of the city. But I don't feel like I have those reasons. And I think when you switch course without those reasons, that's when trust is broken, and that's, that's unacceptable. I, I, can I add in? I think that's right. And I think that's why we, I, I, I really believe we owe it to our city to have this conversation, to have it publicly, to have it authentically, to have it in a way that, you know, that, that, that uh, addresses the complexities of the question. Because in the same as we have a room full of people right here who are saying we demand a, 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 a full block city park, uh, we have other rooms of, of people all over our city who say we demand more creative uh, uh, office space, we demand uh, more tax base, we demand that the city kind of does that. You, you may not see them, but they are. And so we owe it to you, we owe it to you to have a robust conversation, to hear what you have to say. You're, 
Mm -hmm. I am. So that's right. I am here right now. So we owe it to you to have that. We owe it to a lot of other people, too, to have that conversation. And so I think we, what we have to have is an open conversation that's able to hear each other, that's able to really learn from each other. And I'm learning things tonight, and I appreciate it. Uh, and that's able to say, you know, th there's a whole bunch of variables that we have to navigate together. And we are tasked uh, with working together to say what's in the best interest of our community. And we know that in many ways, uh, I want to uh, Mayor Coleman talk about whatever we were talking about as kind of um, uh, wallpaper that you press this part down and you know this a bubble pops up over here that in many ways there are different things that we're gonna have to navigate those things have impacts on each other and we have to come up with the best solution that we can which is why I think it's important for us and and which is why I'm telling you um, I'm open to definitely hearing everything that you have to say but really hearing everything that we all have to say to say how do we come together and understand the wisdom that we all bring to this table and come up with the best solution forward Bill you one more one more one more comment of this and then we'll get moving back Okay. My name is James LaFay. I'm a native St. Paulite, and I lived in that neighborhood within three blocks by the Embassy Suites Renaissance Box for eight years when I returned to St. Paul after being away for 30 years. The city was given a very unique opportunity by a beautiful and generous family to turn that land into a park. When they saw that there was a rapidly growing residential population rising there. A new Lund's grocery store, the Rossmore building, mm -hmm. not Rossmore, the... Penfield. Penfield. Pen Pen but what's the building? The it is Rossmore? Okay, okay, okay. In any case, when the city had that land, and I don't care about any Fitzgerald, Pack, Compact, whatever, they never completed the park that exists right now. It was done by two elements. Public Art St. Paul, led by Amanda Lovely, and St. Thomas University. And I was one of the volunteers because I weeded the borders of that park several years ago. It never would have even been what it is right now with the mural on the wall and the Adirondack chairs and the swirls and the plants if it weren't for those two elements. The city can take no credit. And there has been a very major meeting about this subject at Tin Whiskers a couple of years ago in which the mayor was there, Mike Hom was there, our head of our parks department, and Sage Martinson and they were speaking as if it was a fait accompli that they weren't going to tear down the annex, that they were going to first explore it being our deeply needed a modern office building. And they ignored 90% of the people in the room who were all opposed. And in fact, to this day, Mike Hahn will still not call it a park. He calls it a green space. And he's been reappointed the head of the Parks Department by the current mayor. Right, thank you. He's right there. Thank you. He's right there. But well, here's my point. Okay. The fact is that that park space came to us in a very unique manner. None of the other parks were created as a result of a family contribution of land which had a specific plan. And that was that it would at least be half of that block, if not the whole block. Mm -hmm. okay. And that we have such a shortage of commercial office space, and yet the commercial office space that does exist, they're putting in boutique hotels? Yeah. I mean, really. It doesn't speak to the truth of it. Well. We need the city to get on board. All right. You know, each yep. our, let me finish, let me finish. The HRA has a very easy solution. Withdraw the plans about the police annex and forget it. Forget it. You're in charge. And teach Mike Hom the difference between a green space and a park. Mary, you want to take a swing at that? Or? One of the things that I, what I look forward to in St. Paul, we have a lot of really important conversations to have as a city right now. 
you know, when we have conversations, uh, I think issues all over our city uh, that have become uh, contentious to the point of polarizing, you know. Um, and uh, whether we're talking about the Midway or the Ford plant or Pedro Park uh, or a whole host of other issues, minimum wage, uh, I often see people on both sides of the conversation uh, who are genuinely interested in the best interests of our city, who, who have different ideas and different thoughts about kind of how to build forward our city. Uh, when I look at the national environment, uh, when we disagree, uh, it polarizes us. And we sort of get in our corners and end up fighting against each other. One of the things that I've always loved about St. Paul from my first moment on the city council to just growing up is that I've seen us as a city that possesses the ability uh, to work through disagreements and even learn from each other when we disagree with each other. Um, and I think it's important for us to, uh, there, there have been different processes within our city where I, I, I can sit in a room and feel like, um, we don't, we're, we're, I think we're all better off when we remember everybody in the room is a neighbor who's passionate about the future of our community and that we can work through kind of a lot of these conversations together that we don't necessarily all end up with everything that we started off wanting. Uh, but when we're all in a room this passionate about the future of our city, the future of our neighborhoods, the future of our block, that that's a great thing for us. And so I, I actually appreciate the energy that's in this space. I, I can't say that, you know, when I s hear people talk about the vision of this park, uh, it excites me, right? Uh, and, and, and it excites all of us. We have real challenges to work through, and uh, you know, none of those things are simple. Uh, and I think we owe it to ourselves to stick through this process, to continue to work with each other, uh, to continue to fight for the things that we're passionate about, uh, and to do it in a way that, notice, that knows that, that and acknowledges that we don't have to be fighting against each other uh, when we're fighting for uh, the things that we're passionate about. Okay. That's a good place, I think, to end it. Thanks very much, all three of you. Give them a big hand. They were nice to come. Thank you. We're going to take a, a short break here, as we do with Downtown Live, and do a couple of sort of general updates on things going on downtown from both the creative community and some stuff going on that we've all seen around downtown. And then we're going to uh, restart taking a look at the other parks. Um, shorter period of time, obviously, not all as exciting as Pedro Park. But um, we'll go ahead and start that now. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, folks, for, thank you, Mayor, for coming to History Theater. <laughs> we are, we do represent a little bit of break in this great conversation. We really appreciate you coming down uh, for Downtown Live. This is the second time that um, History Theater has hosted this kind of a conversation. I know that Bill and his group have been uh, really in engendering these uh, exciting civic conversations at other times. So thank you for uh, bearing with us for a little bit of a commercial for some of the arts activity that is happening in uh, downtown St. Paul. Uh, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm Karen Mueller. I'm the managing director here at History Theater. Hi, neighbors. Uh, glad to see you here. Um, I'm not only here to plug History Theater and our current show, but I will. A Crack in the Sky is running now through March 4th. It's a wonderful show, uplifting. It's about a Somali immigrant, Ahmed Youssef. Walk on over and take a look at this show for the next three weekends. Nor am I here to plug Park Square Theater, which has Pirates of Penzance right now. You might want to consider that. I hear, it's got, I hear it's gotten some smashing reviews, so take a look there. So I'm not here just to do all that plugging, but I'm really here to introduce a new coalition of downtown artists and arts organizations 
who are informally getting together to um, try to promote the arts and cultural activity of downtown St. Paul, to create some new activity um, that really will put a shine on all the fantastic stuff that's going on and to let you know and to let others know as we become more of a destination for, for arts activity, for creative activity as we like to call it. Our name is Creative St. Paul. Um, we've just gotten started, so keep an eye open for some pop-up events uh, towards the summer and, and other kind of promotions, bigger promotions that will happen in the near future. In addition, this coalition, Creative St. Paul, has created a new app for all of our phones. I'm going to be the first to learn how to use it. But um, it's a, a new app for your phone, and it'll put all the creative happenings, plays, concerts, exhibits, activity in public spaces uh, in the palm of your hand. To explain it a little further, we have our own cast of characters, Ashton Schneider, marketing associate here at History Theater, and Michael John Pease, executive director at Park Square Court, to uh, briefly introduce this patron-centric app. Thanks. Excuse me, have I come to the right place? I need something special today, and somebody recommended Creative St. Paul. You're in the right place, hon. What can I get you? Oh, I've been wrangling kids all day. I'm at my wit's end. Do you have a menu I can look at? I've got something better than that, hon. I've got an app. Creative St. Paul is working with an app called Du Jour. It will put St. Paul art in the palm of your hand. Creative St. Paul is also going to test some special itineraries like Capital Kids. These pop-up opportunities will feature a themed menu like a family art class at the M that, ha that relates to a public sculpture you can visit, suggestions for a family-friendly bite to eat, then a related exhibit at the Children's Museum. Oh, that sounds perfect. Of course, I won't have the kids after next week when they're back in school, thank God. <laughs> well, there are other special itineraries that are cooking up, like Culture for Lunch, designed for downtown workers, and St. Paul After Dark. I could sure use those. I bet if I had Culture for Lunch, I could lose those extra holiday pounds. <laughs> How does this app work? It combines all the art calendars in one place. Our goal is to have everything creative going on from public art walks to performing arts, art openings, cooking classes, you name it. That way you can find all the art du jour, like this weekend. That's going to be great. These days I can't always find what I'm interested in doing, even though I know it must be going on somewhere in St. Paul. Well, hon, the Du Jour app is being designed around your needs. There's a spot where you can just plug in what you're interested in, and whenever there's a new happening that matches your interest, it just pops into your calendar. I am so glad I came in today. I'm going to stay tuned for more about this Creative St. Paul group, and I am going to download that Du Jour app right now. It's going to be great to have all the creative happenings in St. Paul literally in the palm of my hand. Glad I could help, hon. Do you want fries with that? Oh, yes. And now Peg uh, Gilfoyle and John Manillo have a little something on what's new in downtown St. Paul, folks. Hello, John Manillo. Here we are again to talk about <laughs> new and different things in downtown St. Paul, and just like last time, there is a lot to talk about. Hi, Peg. Let's start with restaurant news. Everybody likes new restaurants, so the new food court at the um, Heartland Restaurant uh, space that used to be there uh, is filling up nicely. The, um, you can go there and you can buy a fish at the Almanac uh, fish market and take it across to the Acto fish bar. By the way, I ate that whole lobster. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and they'll cook it for you however you want. Same thing for P Peterson Meats. That's pretty creative. Uh, also, I want to say that the salty tart is finally open there. And I saw in the paper this week, you might have all seen it too, that their pastry chef is, a, I think, a semi-finalist. Is that right? For a James Beard Award this year as the Outstanding Baker. This is good. Wow, i have to try that. <laughs> and Beer Garden Germania is open where the old Golden's Deli used to be. Uh, uh, here, yeah. Applause for the Beer Garden. We, we hear that construction has started in the new restaurant in the Union Depot, replacing the old Christos restaurant. Uh, it's going to be run by Crave, which is good news for foodies. I want to loop back to the Market House Collaborative space, which is the home for the winter market in the St. Paul's Farmer's Market. Does everybody go to the winter's market? The, um, the Pioneer Press calls it a swanky space, a swanky winter market. 
I was excited to see that along with the market stalls, they're welcoming some pop-up restaurants every Saturday morning starting at 10 o'clock. You can, you know, pop in and sample the pop-up. The next four weeks, FYI, are the St. Dinette, then the Grey Duck Tavern, then Almanac Fish, which should be very convenient since they're in the same space, and also the public kitchen and the bar, so you can, you know, pop in. Pop in. <laughs> we want to uh, say something about the loss of the only true blue building in downtown. <laughs> Just when we were getting used to the sight of the bright blue insulation panels, on the old, on the new Oaks Union Depot building, uh, they go and put up some pretty good looking brick. <laughs> but I have to admit, it's not so bad. <laughs> so here's something to celebrate that I just found out about. Huga, which is the neighborhood cafe across from the depot, is doing something very cool on Monday nights. They're doing profits to a nonprofit every Monday night, and it's a different beneficiary. Monday night is bingo night at Huga, and tonight they're benefiting Save a Bull Dog, Bull Dog Rescue, and next Monday the money is going to Jazz Fest. And on the new and interesting front, the Tria Ice Rink, the practice ice for the wild, is open on top of the old Dayton slash Macy's building. There is open skate time if you want to go and skate, but you can also just go up and look at it to check it out. The wild practices, I'm told, are closed to the public, but at any other time, there's a public elevator up on the Walgreens level. You ride the elevator up to five, and you can just walk around and look at it. Well, we're going to run out of time again. I want to mention that the HHM, which is another way of uh, saying the huge hockey mural, uh, on the side of Treasure Island Center, it's on 6th and Cedar, which uh, it, that mural that you see, there it is, it's only a third of the way done, so it's going to get even huger. Uh, the, uh, also in the building that uh, we now have 700 new public parking spaces right in that building. So we cannot not mention something that's almost gone, which is the St. Paul Cozy Project. Has everybody noticed that? It's a community source, very cool, what you call a yarn bombing project that aims to bring color and cheer to downtown St. Paul. This project wrapped, I think it's 158 city lamp posts between, uh, along 4th Street, from Rice Park all the way down to CHS Field. So take a walk and enjoy it, but don't wait too long because they're only up until March the 3rd, and then I wish I knew what was gonna happen to them because they're so wonderful. And a quick rundown on shows that are playing in our downtown right now. Karen already mentioned here at the History Theater a show called A Crack in the Sky, which is written by a St. Paul-based playwright who also has world premieres this month, I think, at Theater La Teda. And also, where, where's the other one, Karen? At Penumbra, I think. So a very hot playwright, and that's a very good way to sort out your theater world. Uh, Park Square, in a triumphant demonstration of why theaters have two stages, is playing both the Pirates <laughs> of Penzance and A Raisin in the Sun. You can catch Lady Smith Black Mambazo at the Ordway this Friday night, and then you can turn around and hear Rigoletto at the Minnesota Opera, opening on St. Patrick's Day. And before or after, we advise that you stop in to St. Paul's Speakeasy and Jazz Club, the View Carré, which is downstairs in the Ham Building, sort of below Park Square. Uh, you can start out at the happy hour. You can hear free live music at View Carré starting around six, and then you stay for a bigger show five nights a week, View Carré. Well, we just want, uh, well, give her a hand, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We want to finish with just a few questions that we don't know the answers for, but if anyone else does, let us know and we'll share it with you next time. My question is, what's ever going to happen to the third floor of Town Square where the old Kveshian carousel used to be? Good question. And we'd like to know what's going to happen to the Jacks building in Lower Town. And in particular, I'd like to know what's going to happen to artist Takumba Aiken's mural that's on that west-facing wall. You see it up there on the slide. And although nobody will ever tell us, I'd kind of like to know who tagged that wall and defaced it. Really, says I. <laughs> Finally, we want to thank all those people who helped build the 2018 Ice Palace in Rice Park. Uh, uh, they, <clears throat> it was built by, uh, it was helped to be built by uh, individuals purchasing their own ice blocks. 
Now it's all said and done, uh, it's torn down, and everybody was able to keep their own ice blocks <laughs> at, at home in their bathtub. So. <laughs> That's Thank the you. update on our wonderful downtown neighborhood. Thank you. Give it up for Peg and John. We're going to broaden the discussion now to uh, uh, other downtown parks, and uh, Councilmember Naker is going to stay on the stage, and we're going to welcome Mike Hom, the Director of uh, Parks and Rec, and uh, Bruce Corey, the Director of Planning and Economic Development. Give them a nice ovation, huh? Now, we're going to have a brief presentation from some citizens who were involved in these parks, and then I want you fellows to react, and Councilmember, you to react as well. John, why don't you start with... Um, What's going on at Mears? I guess you got good news on the, the music at Mears? Yes. Uh, music went down Pull the mic up and go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Music in Mears was a little shaky last, um, uh, last season. Uh, the promoter of it had some financial problems. Uh, I spoke with Joe Spencer today who told me that the city is close to making arrangements with another promoter with the help of the old one um, to continue uh, Thursday night's music in Mears. So that's good news for us. That's great. Uh, a couple other things, uh, updates on Mears Park and what we're dealing with. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, um, we uh, raised enough money uh, to uh, have matching funds to repair the stream. We ended up spending $40,000 on that. The, um, the uh, uh, Parks Department put in 12 new lamp posts uh, in the park, LED lighting, which really helps it a lot. Uh, the uh, tree, trees in the park, we have 120 ash trees. Well, we have ash borer in the city. Uh, the city has been treating those trees. The good news is, is that uh, it's working so far. So if we can, uh, if those can survive long enough, maybe the ash borers will go to uh, China and we won't have to worry about them. The, um, uh, uh, we were, uh, for the first time after uh, a number of years, <coughs> the uh, holiday lights in the park are better than they have been. And they, well, uh, the, the, the city <coughs> contributed $15,000, Lower Town Future Fund another five, and then individuals uh, uh, made a collection for another 5,000, uh, dollars Spire and Saints were part of that. Um, we hired a very uh, an installer who maintained it <coughs> throughout the year, uh, and so that has. Uh, and we got a little more creative and had a uh, <coughs> red uh, tree as a focal point in the park. Uh, and finally, um, uh, coming up in the future, we're going to have to do something with the pavers in the park. Uh, the park is now about 25 years old. It really wasn't built for heavy traffic, and when I mean heavy, I mean like cars and trucks. Uh, and we're gonna have to replace those pavers, so that's down the road. At any rate, uh, we have 80 volunteers who take care of the gardens. It's a beautiful park. People uh, really do love it. Uh, it's easy for me. Um, I just sit there and take credit for everything, and everybody else does the work, so okay. thank you. Thanks, John. Um, Mike, how do you balance out the, the capital needs for these places when you have a request like that for Mears, to, which is extremely popular, and how do you prioritize all that? Uh, it's a great question. I want to start by uh, just acknowledging that uh, this room this time, is a, it's a great time, a great opportunity to be a parks director in the city of St. Paul, to have a community that is invested in their parks and is asking um, how we can do better, and we're talking about... Uh, um, what the choices are to work with, uh, work for a city council that wants to invest in the same thing and to work for a mayor that's asking those same questions. So it's a, a great time to be in this role and work with our team. Um, the, the challenge of taking care of what we have versus um, pursuing new and priori prioritizing is, uh, is a big part of our work. Um, the, the big change, what the community can expect, is we're working to do better with data to drive our decisions. We um, just initiated system-wide, including the downtown neighborhood, for all of our parks, um, including the downtown parks, Rice Park, Mears Park, Pedro Park, Kellogg Mall Park, Wakuta Commons, to do an analysis to figure out um, what we have, what its useful life is, 
and how to prioritize what those strategic investments are. So when we're um, in a situation where we're making recommendations to policymakers to make decisions about our investments, we have, we have data to inform those decisions. We're not just um, basing it on the recommendations of professional staff or from feedback from the community. So we're, we're really relying on data. Well, that's great. John, thanks. Let's move on here. Uh, lower landing, uh, Gene Hall. You need a hand, Gene, or? All right. You're shy and demure. <laughs> I can get up, but I can't get down. Hear you. You need a bridge uh, down a lower landing. Is that what the deal is there? <laughs> that is uh, the starting point of the conversation yeah. that we had when the first um, advisory group got together. Mm -hmm. We said, here's 21 acres of land, um, huge bound of space right next to downtown, probably within 10, 15 minutes walking for any of the residents who are downtown or want to go for a stroll along the river. Um, but then we said, you'll get killed trying to get there, trying to get across the street, um, trying to walk across where the one light is and the cars are going fast. So that access to the park was a starting point and truly um, lots of good ideas in between, but ended up as still a question um, with the hope that eventually there would be a, a bridge from the Union Depot over to connect people to the park so that you can walk there, you can ride a bike there. Um, imagine that, because when you get, if you can go across on your bike from your house in downtown, your apartment, your condo in downtown. You can go to Bruce Vento. You can go to Battle Creek. I mean, it's an amazing opportunity if you could only get there. The other thing that was very important, and you can tell me when to stop. Well, do one more and uh, then you can stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that um, the people that came to that advisory committee had um, a real clear vision that two things um, had to happen. One, that that park would honor the natural beauty, historical value, geological value, Native American value of being an important piece of the Great River Passage. But the second part of that vision was that this park also needed to meet the needs of downtown residents for recreational space. And so um, this park and other parks that are located, um, like at Wakuta Commons, Pedro Park, um, probably won't look a lot like the completely like Mears Park or Rice Park. Um, and so we spend a lot of time imagining how to combine those two interests, how to make it beautiful. Uh, one of the ways to do that was to make a loop trail in there. You don't just pass through, but you walk down and then up along the road and back down so you actually have a space to walk. That you would move the, oh, um, the oversight kind of thing back toward the um, road level because there's some height there and you could see up and down the river and it's um, beautiful. All right. And then, but there would be basketball, there would be foosball, there would be a large dog park. Um, dog park serves some important things. The ac recreational activity, most, most people who participate in recreational activity in downtown walk their dog. And if you can actually go and walk your dog someplace, and get some exercise, meet people and talk, that's the kind of dog park that we're talking about. It also, provide some safety by bringing people to that area because right now there's nobody down there. It's unsafe, it's pretty scary. So if we can bring, start bringing people there and identify it through an entranceway as a park. So that's what I've got to say. You've sold us. <laughs> Chris Tomford, you, you wanna come up, Chris? And uh, we'll get some reaction from the, the rest of the panel after we talk to you. Uh, Wakuta Commons, what's going on there? 
A lot of good things are happening with Cuda Commons. It's sort of a uh, secret, uh, not too well known uh, park. Its original intention was to provide for a small neighborhood an on the ground park, not connected to the skyways, not a place for spectacular events to take place, but a kind of uh, meeting place, a backyard or a front yard for the people in our neighborhood. And I would say the people in our neighborhood represent the new face of St. Paul. There is no majority group there. About 200 Somali children, about uh, 50 to 100 African American children, many of whom have fled to our city because they were afraid of being shot in, oh. in Chicago. I met a little boy, Keyshawn, I said, how are you doing today? He said, I haven't been shot yet. He's about five years old. Yeah. He had just come from wow. Chicago. Wow. So it's a great park. It uh, came into a little bit of dis disrepair. A group of people in the neighborhood got together and formed a Friends of Okuda Commons Park with the help of uh, the Parks Department. Rebecca has been very responsive, and uh, thanks to the work of Alice Messer, a designer, we have a, a design to uh, upgrade the park, which is represented back here. Basically, <coughs> work on the big green space, make sure the grass is growing and doesn't turn into a dirt pit. There may be 50 uh, little boys and girls out there playing uh, soccer, so that's very important. You got room for a field? A uh, you're right, there'll be a soccer field out there. Great. And uh, it's sort of beaten down right now, but the Parks Department is working to keep the grass growing. We want to put a, a permanent uh, hard surface uh, play area up in the top left-hand corner, the northeast corner, as you see. All right. A lot of the kids like to play basketball, of course. I'm an old basketball player. I'm 100% for this. It's a great, a great thing to do. And we want to finish off uh, planting trees in the area. Uh, and we're working with the uh, parks, uh, the, excuse me, the Parks Department, the University of Minnesota to make sure the trees are planted and, and grow and thrive. And finally, we, there's a um, fountain in the park now, but it serves as a uh, bathtub, uh, common urinal, uh, bubble bath, dog drinking spot, you name it. Doesn't All, sound good. No, not so good. Anything that a human being could do, I've seen done in that park, for better or for worse. We don't need to know everything. No, we don't know. <laughs> no more details are needed. <laughs> but we're, uh, the long range plan is to remove that and put into a splash pad. Right. So uh, the children in the neighborhood have a great place to, uh, to play. And I think it complements other parks. If we can have children sort of zero to 10 playing with us, older children can play uh, and, and more organized sports in, uh, in the areas where uh, Gene has talked about. And it also complements, I think, the work that we're 100% supportive of in uh, Pedro Park as well. Yeah, theme is emerging tonight. I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks very much, Chris. You're thanks. quite welcome. Uh, <laughs> Professor Cor I know Professor Corey from uh, his days really pioneering immigration research uh, in town here, and he was on this topic long before it was in the news every day, and so he's really one of the longtime experts on the immigration matters. And I, I wonder about this issue of, of having the, the new St. Paul residents uh, get them involved in the parks and, and, and how important that would be and what are some ideas to, uh, are, are they taking full advantage of what you, these great treasures you have here? Uh, thanks, Eric. It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, be with you, and uh, I want to thank the people who are here today, and a warm welcome I received as I walked in the uh, door. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I accepted the job uh, in January, and it's an incredible honor to uh, work for Mayor Carter and his vision to build the city uh, across neighborhoods, across income groups, across business sizes. And also admire the enthusiasm and integrity of uh, council members that I've toured uh, with them, the awards, and, and I saw represented in council member Naker here today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I, uh, in answering your questions, I want to share with you an, a, a something that's relevant today. Um, I know a young, I knew this gentleman in 1991 and I met him yesterday again. Uh, he works very hard. And at the end of the day, uh, he is tied out, and he was very tired yesterday. Um, and he would like to be uh, in a place where he could be an artist, because at his heart, he's an artist. And I tried to work with him to, to make sure he gets there. But he lives in the Rondo neighborhood, and he was telling me about 
uh, as you know, the history of Rondo and the freeway coming through and the African-American communities losing their homes. And he said, after all the struggle and after all that we've done, all we got is that little piece of land that's the Londo Commemorative Plaza. That's all we got. Um, and I'm hearing today uh, a similar uh, sentiment. And, and we in the city, and I want to commit, as I commit to him and as I commit to you, we want to make sure that we work together to expand the opportunities for everybody. Uh, and, and whatever way we can, I want to commit that uh, to you. Uh, in an e uh, age of limited resources, we've got to come up with some innovative solutions. So coming to you about uh, the question that you have about new communities and their spaces for play and alternative forms like soccer, I was so happy to hear, and Wakuda Field. For sure. Uh, uh, how we can get opportunities like them uh, and I, I admire, as I, a family here uh, for 30 years, uh, the neat way that the Parks and Rec uh, Department have connected to communities, including my kids, as they grew up. Uh, especially appreciative around the times when schools suddenly closed and the parks were open for them, and the different opportunities that we have. So one thing that st struck me in that relationship was the accessibility of the park staff. And they were very important. They would call home and say, hey, are you signing in? Are you coming for the th things? And I think those uh, openness and engagement with the communities and in integrating them with the baseball games, a new game. Uh, I remember seeing in the field uh, a gentleman from the community helping little Somali uh, children uh, pl uh, play baseball. And uh, I think that kind of engagement is what uh, our youth need that alternative opportunities uh, because they don't have in this age of Instagram especially yeah. uh, the opportunity to engage. But thank you and, and I look forward to engaging. Uh, Michael, well, St. Paul is different than when you were growing up, you know, and you probably when you started in the yeah. park and rec department. Um, is that change your focus a little bit or are you modifying plans to meet the demands of a new population or about the same? or? Uh, uh, indeed, it's different. I, I think one of the one of the constants, though, is um, we, working in the public sector, need help in order to to do our best. Um, we will we have better plans at Wakuda and at Lower Landing when the community is engaged, when our staff go out and meet people where they are. Um, we will we will implement plans quicker. Um, and better at uh, Rice Park, where we have a partnership with the um, with the Garden Club and our St. Paul Parks Conservancy, and when we develop Pedro Park, if the community if the community is engaged and we can leverage um, private resources to mm -hmm. expand our public resources, mm -hmm. we will do better in programming uh, at Pedro Park, where we worked with the University of St. Thomas. It was noted before, right? And um, with local in public art St. Paul to pull that off, with um, Mr. Manillo and the Friends of Mears Park at Mears Park um, to do programming. Um, uh, it, we need the help, and um, re regardless of what the challenges are, the, the constant has been in order to get, um, get the most done, to do it the best, um, to meet as many needs as possible, uh, we need to continue this conversation and um, maximize our effort, the public's effort, with what, um, with what all neighborhoods can come together with, including downtown, to, uh, to pull these projects off. And, and council member, I, I've covered government in this state since the 1970s, and I looked on the website, and I was shocked by the number of partners that like the Park and Rec Department has, Met Council, uh, Park Service, DNR, it goes on and on, uh, foundations, grants nationally. Uh, d d are, are you active, or is the council active in leveraging all these partners to get the resources that we have, you know, enormous number of great ideas, but you need the, the money, obviously. Right, well we, we, we try to be and we certainly support and I think Director Hom does an amazing job building those partnerships. I think it's important to note, you know, when I first came onto the council, I thought, well, if we need to get something done, if we need to build a park, if we need to build a road, well, I mean, we have, we have taxing power, right? Don't we, just, don't we just raise the levy when we need to, you know, for the projects that we need to get done? And I, I quickly learned not only that people don't like that very much, but also um, <laughs> that a 1% a increase in the levy yields a million dollars. So if we were to do any of the parks up here, and Mears Park is certainly a lot more than a million dollars, we had a 29% increase in the levy last year, right? 
that would, that would be what we would be talking about. We'd be talking about tens of percentages of, of levy increases just for one project. So the partners are critical, but I think something else that Director Hahn mentioned earlier is really important and I want to go back to it because I want to commend the department for focusing on data. You probably saw all these plans coming up on the screen and, and if you're me, and, and I'm sure you feel the same way, you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of planning, a lot of exciting things, but we were just talking about a park that was planned a decade ago that we say we don't have the money for now, so how are we gonna have the money to do all these things that are being planned now? And it's a, it's, that's why it is so critical that we know exactly what state our parks are in, so we know how much it costs to maintain them, and so that as we're planning new parks, we have a sense of how much money we're gonna need when those parks come online. And I'll give you one example of that, a corollary in our public works department. We haven't been talking a lot about streets tonight, which is a relief to me, um, frankly. But, um, but the city was founded in 1849. It wasn't until about five years ago that we created a five-year street reconstruction plan. So before that, the streets were reconstructed, I kid you not, based on how often you called and how effective your council member was in asking Public Works to redo your street. Now, we have a plan that is based on the pavement condition index, it's based on traffic volumes, it's scientific, it's objective, that says, and how recently the street was reconstructed before, that tells us when each of our streets is gonna come online. And to me, that shouldn't have taken 150 years to happen, but it's wonderful that it's there now. And it's the same thing, in my opinion, for parks. We need to have a, a plan based on the condition of our parks and rec facilities, how long things have been in the comprehensive plan, that tells us what we need to be saving and how much we need to be investing when. Uh, Professor Corey, when uh, businesses come or residents want to come for economic development purposes to St. Paul, does this downtown green space, is that a, a, a saleable part of the pitch when you try to attract people and businesses? Yes, um, recently in a conversation with one such person, uh, they mentioned the importance of uh, not only green spaces but also uh, the entertainment, uh, like we saw that app, and all the different attractions in the in the city. These all these are all uh, part because at the end of the work day or at lunchtime they want to enjoy uh, life, the same as the residents do. And that's why uh, I'm committed to work actively with you and with everybody uh, in the city to make this downtown uh, the best downtown in the world. And how could we do it? Well, we could find where we are doing a lot of good things like the Downtown uh, uh, Alliance and the uh, uh, different groups that are engaging in various dimensions of the downtown life uh, to make it a vibrant place and a place to be. And it's happening. Mike, what's happening to the, is it called the balcony the, on the bluffs there where the, the jail was? And the, 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 the situation for St. Paul and the Mississippi, it seems to me, is challenging because it's a bluff. You're way up. It isn't like you, you go right and there's a beach into the, into the river, but is there anything cooking there? Or? Um, I think, um, Eric, what you're referring to is our Great River Passage Initiative and specifically the River Balcony yeah, Project. that's it. And to uh, update the folks here on, on where, where um, the community's at with that, we've uh, a couple concepts had emerged for a, a river balcony, and um, what we're doing now is working uh, really with our partners. It's another great example of partnership with um, the, the private and public um, property owners along the river bluff to come up with some resources to advance this, the concept to a schematic design, and really to see um, what is possible in a, in a pragmatic way to connect those properties and to establish the contiguous public access and public space at that um, at that the top of the bluff level that will connect people visually and possibly physically um, down to the lower level. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, within a couple months we'll have um, uh, partnership resources established so we can initiate that schematic design and we can find out if the ideas that are brought forward. Um, can be realized and what the property owners need to do to invest okay. in them on their own property. Now I'm glad you're all here and your council member is here because during the Super Bowl, the zip line across the Mississippi <laughs> was sold out. And I wonder from Memorial Day to Labor Day, if that wouldn't be, and you probably would be the first person to... To ride it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, is that just too pie in the sky or too expensive? That thing, it was right, zero right. over there and it was sold out in, in minutes. No, I know. It's, yeah. Eric, you would be amazed how many times a week it's, um, it's potholes and it's pee and it's a zipline. 
Really? Um, those are my top inbox uh, messages, top <laughs> topics. Seriously. Who would write it? Anybody? <laughs> All right. So what would that cost, Mike? What, what, would that be a, a big number? I'm sure it's a big number. I'm sure we have an example of what it would cost if we look right across the river. So yeah. We can, we can and would the city out. need liability insurance or? <laughs> no. <laughs> but Eric, uh, the connection of the river with the city yeah. and the brand that, uh, that, that would be built around that is another key component yeah. of what we could make this, city, this yeah. downtown alive. And I'm glad it's happening. Uh, well, I think we're, Bill, you about ready to, let me, let me just, before we go, I give you a homework assignment. But let me find it first. There, did you help host the um, Urban Parks Conference that was here last July, Mike? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, just, this will be easy to do. There's a website called greatergreener.org. Greatergreener.org. And on there are 20 or so PDFs from the presentations that were made yep. that weekend. And it's amazing the information on that website, forming park advocacy groups, park-oriented development, engaging immigrants in parks, dealing with homeless in parks, dealing with youth violence in urban parks. Very interesting stuff for you park advocates, and you clearly are engaged in the, in the subject matter. So it's greatergreener.org. That must have been a heck of a conference. Um, it, it was amazing. We had over a thousand uh, people here internationally from urban centers all over the globe, primarily North America, that came to St. Paul and Minneapolis to see the top two park systems in the United States. And I, uh, if, if I can reflect on that just briefly, Please. I think it is an important foundation for this conversation and ones that we have all over the city in every neighborhood to understand we start this discussion from a position of strength. We have, a, we have a, a great park system, the majority of which I inherited from people that had my role before and made great investments. We have a great park staff that works hard each and every day to do the best they can to deliver the services you expect. And in the downtown neighborhood, uh, people that were here, we have, good, we have really good bones um, for our system, despite, regardless of what we aspire to, having Rice Park, having Wakuta Commons, having uh, Mears Park, Kellogg Mall Park, and Pedro Park there to build from is uh, really an enviable status, especially in downtown. So it's, as we work through these challenges, we really start the conversation from a position of strength. No doubt. Uh, with the weather challenging again tonight as uh, we send you out into the, uh, the weather uh, and reflecting on the Super Bowl, isn't it nice that we no longer have to pretend how much we like the cold? <laughs> <laughs> Please give a nice round of applause to the panel. Bill Hanley, thanks everybody. Just a couple of, of wrap-up announcements. If you want to talk about reviewing what happened during Super Bowl and Winter Carnival this year, tomorrow morning at Black Dog, our friends at Capitol River Council will be holding a conversation about that. And we will, Downtown Live, will be back here on April 16th for 90 minutes with the mayor. So thank you and we'll see you then. <laughs>